to uh, the Node Institute, which is this place here, um, where we try to be a bit of a hub for the visual programming community. And this is the Touch Designer Roundtable, which is the meeting of the Berlin Touch Designer community. You, so very welcome. And uh, we have a nice program this evening, starting with Healy, who's going to talk about her uh, work with um, Automaton Lab. I'm not going to say much more, so yeah. you can say it all. And then um, we're going to hear from Stanislav, who's also a very prophetic, iconic almost, uh, mm -hmm. touch designer programmer here in Berlin, um, and also a teacher and an artist. And um, then um, later we're going to um, have Markus Heckmann remoting in. He's technical director at Derivative. Um, and he's going to talk about the news, news from Derivative. And you can throw your questions at him. And, uh, maybe one more thing, because we always have a bit of a hard time to find people who actually want to present. Uh, so this is by no means something where you have to be hyper-professional, like our presenters today. You could also be like a complete hobbyist, you could just start out. This is really not pitching your stuff to someone, but this is like talking in the community with people who just like the stuff. You know? So please don't be shy if you have ever something that you would like to discuss or show or whatever, please uh, drop me a line. And um, the next meeting is going to be in a month. Um, I think it's June 23rd, and we don't have any presenters yet. So um, please step forward, uh, <laughs> because this is the salt in the soup of these meetings. So now I don't want to um, delay any further. I'm very happy that Helene is here. Helene is also uh, a resident here at the Node Institute, so she uh, didn't come a very long way, but uh, <laughs> it was a long time coming. It was a long time coming, yes. <laughs> so. All right. Um, let me just squeeze through. <coughs> Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Hayden. Yeah, like Stefan said, I work from here as well. Um, so yeah, I use Touch Designer the last 2022, like five years or six years, I think. Uh, and I think it's a software that I use. I, I'm a designer uh, professionally, and yeah, uh, I work in uh, I worked in big installations, interactive stuff, but I also do design, and I use Touch Designer in my design work as well, like creating textures, motion graphics uh, for commercial clients, or yeah, like bigger installations. Um, and I think today I'm gonna show one work, and uh, that from recent years is more of an experimental work. Uh, it's called Reji KI. Uh, it was basically an experimentation and a theater piece where we tried to create a uh, artificial intelligent director uh, through a course of like almost year and a half of research and then collecting data from the performers. So I have the patch for that, which I haven't opened in so long. Uh, it kind of works. So <laughs> I'll show that and I'll also show you a little bit of the other stuff I'm doing, um, smaller things with uh, Touch Designer, which is not necessarily like really big installation work. Yeah. Um, can I share my screen? Yes. Also, it's going to be kind of like a journey through my desktop. I made a folder, so I hope it goes smoothly. Um, yeah, so first I think I want to show the uh, trailer for the Reggie KI. And um, I think it explains it better than me. And then I can just walk you through what I did and uh, what was the research about and how we use Touch Design in it. All right. <laughs> Das Grundinteresse für das Projekt, sich mit einer KI zu beschäftigen, bestand eigentlich darin, dass die Gesellschaft sich zunehmend verändert und Technologie ein immer stärker werdender Akteur darin ist und diese Prozesse eigentlich so diskret ablaufen, dass wir sie gar nicht bewusst wahrnehmen oder ja, teilweise gar nicht wissen, dass sie überhaupt stattfinden und lasst es uns äh, untersuchen, was da eigentlich dahinter steckt und diese Prozesse, die da passieren, äh, sichtbar machen ne? und auf eine Bühne heben. So 
oh yeah, Reggie KI is uh, like a couple of years now that uh, it happened. And um, basically uh, the project that we aimed uh, to create um, emotion recognition of the performers uh, and through the emotion recognition, we directed them on stage through a touch designer and these uh, small units called um, whoop, PDAX, which I designed and built it myself. Um, yeah, these small gadgets were given to the performers early on uh, when the whole project was not even in stage and so that they were data collection units. And uh, through two other developers, Meredith Thomas and Gilbert Sinnott, we created a backend that is like a, it's like a touch screen. And then we collect seven emotions that is selected by the director. And the performers trained with the PDAX over a course of six months. And then we fed that data into an emotion recognition system. And then we would get a value of how or what they are acting on stage. And through that knowledge, we created a state machine uh, and touch designer where we were talking with the PDAX on stage on like telling basically the performers what to act. So it was like a laboratory, like an experimentation, like we would tell them to act angry and they would act angry and then we would just show the results of what AI is doing and I would be triggering with the touch designer patch, the AI machine to like which state it should go to, like uh, and then what are we analyzing and Basically, it was a lot of networking. And then the whole thing was this idea of experimentation automation. So um, we tried to automate the sound uh, through the AI data and then like 120 cues uh, through IC to sound and also the light because we used web sockets. Uh, so we would know actually, oof, is this the right patch? I don't even know. Um, but we would know when the yeah, when the channel was open somewhere, I don't know, like through RTSP and uh, web sockets that I would know that, that, okay, this performer is online now and the light will just direct it to that performer and the whole scenography was done through the basically touch designer telling everyone what to do, where to act and where to go. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not really gonna, I think, go super deep into the patch because this is also was for the documentary. And I like I did it years ago, so I don't know like uh, where's what. But I have the visuals one. So it was like two patches running on the AB computer. One is just uh, doing the automation and Python mostly, um, and the other one is just creating the visuals. And I mean, I do kind of like the last five years end up being in these projects where I have to visualize AI uh, and then make it meaningful. Um, so this time. My approach was that, okay, if it's a laboratory, we should be very literal about it and show all the data. Uh, and we used simple graphics. We kept on showing what the data was incoming and we used like, I don't know, like other things like heads of the performers and their value and what they're acting. And they would like loudly say what they are like, if they were happy with their performance, if they're not happy with their performance and things like this. Yeah, and then we had like, <clears throat> what else? Mm. Uh, like almost a, like a graph so that we had five screens in the end that, you know, this ball going up and down so you could just watch each performer acting uh, and how they're acting on the stage. And uh, I don't know, it was like a lot of uh, effort on creating the visuals and making it understandable. Uh, and I think it's still like a, for me, like a, also like a designer process to how to make AI understandable to an audience because it's always really hard because it's a value between zero to one and how do you explain that, uh, what we're doing? So I think it's a combination of like, okay, yeah, you can use a node-based programming tool, but how to make it visually interesting is still a little bit of a research. Um, I think which brings me to this is a continued collaboration um, to this guy, uh, which was, I think like a month ago in the Dortmund Digital Arts Academy that we were doing this research again. So I worked with Diana and Diana and I also shared a desk here. She is a part of Replica, well, she's the founder of Replica Institute. And they have, um, Yeah. Yeah, it's all like edge computing. So it's on the part, yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, bu -bu -bu -bu. Okay, let's get to this. So, uh, this project is like basically another continuation of AI and like how to visualize AI. Uh, so, the um, it's like I think like all of my work out like at this point is chained to one another. Um, so like after doing Regic AI and learning what was communicating well and what was not communicating well, uh, and this this iteration is completely a different one. Here is the performers are wearing a bodysuit, and there is an already an AI system created by Mika and Pure Data, I think. And then this is like also like live and through their like stretch sensors they uh, emulate the data and then they create sound in space. And then I get through them uh, their data of like seven sensors. And then Meredith runs a, a artificial intelligence system which uh, does a latent walk, a latent space walk, and then we try to see if the AI is learning through the performer's movements basically. So in this iteration, it was just like a workshop we did together like that lasted like a week. Uh, we just wanted to concentrate on the breath uh, instead of concentrating all of the sensors at the same time. And what we did was like, I basically created a touch designer, like I, again, a small ball uh, with feedback on it, but it was connected to their breath. And so whenever they breathe it out, that uh, it would go like bigger or like smaller. And so it was just a small experimentation, but I'll show you a footage of what we were doing. Obviously, like, so I can show you how the data is on my windows is crashing and how the whole thing is was yeah, working yeah, is that yeah, we had yeah. two touch designer patches running along uh, and one is analyzing the latent space and all the data and then that patch was sending it to me through SC um, and I just uh, like um, filter the data and then visualize it and also work with the performers like, okay, when is it actually working and which positions it's actually working. So it's kind of like a little bit of an invasive process because you keep telling a human to, okay, now breathe or no, don't breathe or things like this. Um, but yeah. It's just that's Meredith sitting there and then it's like a spaceship. Almost. Kate and the uh, purple one is Diana, so that we wanted to make it very obvious and we started scenography like, okay, screens wide. So this is basically just the research and it's, uh, I hope that it goes further, uh, but it was like a very much a groundwork again for us to have to like, yeah, visualize AI without actually doing a lot of particle fields and yeah. Um, I don't know, how am I doing in time? Should I? Uh, so basically, I have five more minutes for presentation, and then uh, we can still have some time for questions and discussions. Yeah, okay, maybe then I show some more. Yeah, but I can't. Uh, okay. Show a few more videos. So we also like played with footage uh, that they were selecting for the project, and we wanted to create like a more poetic storytelling. So the performers themselves created this first breath, um, you know, like warming up my hands with my breath or like so that they were like cues for them to breathe in a certain way or like ragged breath, dog breath um, and things like this. Do I have more things to show? Yeah. I can't see.
so also like for uh, them it was like almost a rehearsal um, it's quite nice and funny in a way because the performers learn how to behave uh, with the system you're creating and they almost like learn in the process how to manipulate it through their because they're so good in comment with their body and I find that very like that integration between like theater and creative coding because then it's just kind of like this you're creating this human machine interface and I think yeah my work uh, my more like experimental work uh, is now going towards that uh, but yeah that's pretty much it before I sign off I'm gonna do promotion um, <laughs> Um, we are doing next month this thing called The Lab uh, with Automaton. I don't know if anyone, Anton is there. Hi, Anton. He's one of the organizers. I don't know if Annie's not here. Uh, we're going to do it in the water tanks in Prenzlauerberg. Uh, it's the space. And we're inviting basically artists and our friends uh, from the media arts community uh, to their, like, show their working progress work and create a laboratory all together. And yeah, um, it's going to be 21st till 25th, when? Yeah, 21st till 25th of June. And yeah, um, I mean, we will have the online details. And I think maybe we publish through Node or something. And you guys can all check it out. Yeah. And that's it for me. So yeah, we still have um, around like 10 to 15 minutes at max for uh, discussion and questions. So uh, feel free to ask around um, or open a discussion if you want to. If you get a question, it would be nice if you could repeat the question so that the stream can okay. get it. Because uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is uh, filmed in front of a live audience for, for the internet. So. Go along. Yes. So, how does the breath translate into the sensor? Uh, sorry? How does the breath translate into the sensor? The sensor? So, um, so, the question is how does the breath uh, translate into sensor measure? So, they have a, a sensor here and on the back, and basically, I'm measuring how, yeah, how it, like, how it goes and how low it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like on the stretch sensor, all of it is like, it's not a motion capture. I didn't do the sensors, but it's not a motion capture. It's a stretch sensor that they wear uh, through their, I don't have a photo of it show, um, on the computer. But it's like, yeah, attached so to the whole body the and the, yeah, the and, uh, exactly. And then that is actually real time fed into a, an AI algorithm that creates the sound. So like they, we train the AI algorithm every time uh, through this, I don't think I have the video here, sorry, but. Yeah, wait, let me check. I think I can uh, find the, uh, find it. Uh, yeah, so it recognizes the poses. So we do like a training in the beginning of the, they do like it's their research. It's been, this research has been going on for a couple of years now. So they train the AI and like, for example, this pose or like this pose or, and then that is mapped into certain um, sounds. And then through their movement, then it's again recognized and then the system generates the sound uh, real time. So the pose, as it is fairly elderly, that's with this motion Yeah, exactly, it's stretch sensors. It's stretch Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, uh, the AI is basically doing emotion recognition on the performers, how they act. Okay, they've, been the they've been trained and yeah, and then they've been training with the same uh, AI algorithm that's just specifically created for that. Uh, like we developed it like from like of course obviously using other libraries. Um, yeah, and then it's like almost like this edge competing on the pie is combined like with cropping the face and then 
doing emotion recognition through a like big uh, AI machine. Through the PDAX. Uh, no, through the PDAX, through these uh, small uh, thingies. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to show something. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, the, these computers, uh, like the director had uh, his own interface, like a front end. Uh, so he would just uh, put in the what they should train, like either a full body training or a face training. And then, okay, now you train an angst, for example. Uh, so it was also like an experimentation how to train, I guess, like performers, uh, like in a more systematic way. And, and then the idea was that, you know, like uh, what a director's role is to actually is to recognize emotions and direct them, right? Mm -hmm. And we were mimicking the system of being a director through recognizing emotions. Yeah, kind of, like we did this on stage because it was funny, like uh, the whole thing was also mocking it. Uh, and they would act like, okay, they would get a bad score and they'd be like, oh no, shit man, like my score is so low. Like, you know? yeah. uh, for the evolving process, I mean, let's say if a person like, is happy, then you figure some sound, and you do some post, you get some sound. But would it be like repetitive or how do you approach that, like, about the time, or how, how can you bring some generative thing to the installation, or, or just like, just fix this pose, this sound, this emotion, this sound, or? So I think that's a, like a big research question, right? Um, I think, in my opinion, at this point, it might change in two days or two years, I don't know. It needs to be done through like stage design and scenography, um, more than, like, I think there's a very much a value in data visualization. But I think when we go, like this is, was my learning experience, when I, whenever I went full on data visualization on projects, that you lack the emotion almost. Because all these research projects are like somewhere it's not really science, like it's very scientific, but then it's also very poetic, right? Like because, like why do, do, do we wanna capture emotion or stretch sensors on a human, you know? Like because we're actually like questioning some things more like um, in a human way, you know? Um, so not to make it repetitive, I think is a combination of things. And I don't think it just, in my opinion, doesn't really depend on which software you code with or how you visualize the data. But right now I think like having this, for example, the Dortmund experience of having just one week of concentrating only one data and then one information at a time and trying to visualize that was such a like big luxury for me because in a production you don't really get that. Uh, it's just like, yeah, make it look nice and... <laughs> 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 it's done, yeah. 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 Um, I have a question about the question of the music. Um, the music, did you, did you also like perform it live to the live audience? We just showed it to the <laughs> residents who were doing the residency in Dortmund uh, with the Digital Academy. Um, also, there is another uh, theater group who does similar. Uh, God, I forgot their name. But they also do sound and uh, movement and AI. And they were there, which was nice, you know, like to kind of share uh, like uh, with people. So we showed it just to the artist uh, in residence. Uh, through touch designer. Yeah. So basically, in all of these things, touch designer is always like bridging, like it's a, almost like a s serving all the information and then it connects uh, the pie with the thing, like it just uh, plays a, like a central hub for. So you were directly addressing the last week. Yeah, exactly. To a grand MA or just depends on whatever, which theater and whatever uh, setup you have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as far as I was my research, like the output of the neural networks to visualize or like further yeah, uh, visit uh, for the system, 
um, I wonder if you also used to say this before, like uh, going into the neural network, like the latent space or some variables, um, like going into, into the credibility of AI and like this question of what is actually going on in these layers before the output. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, so the theater project was almost a year and a half. Uh, obviously, first, like, uh, I think the visualization part, we did it in last month. So the first, uh, the other, like, rest of the, whatever, 12 or 11 months we had was just research and analyzing mm -hmm. the data. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, but I think it's still, uh, what I learned from that project is it's, like, I think, yeah, you can have both systems running at the same time, but I think what what's also hard is to connecting these systems together and making them work together. So maybe not living in the last month is <laughs> <It's> also <laughs> like a part of the research, yeah. yeah. Okay. Any questions from the time? Nope. Silence as ever. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, thank you.
I'm going to hear from uh, Stanislav Glasov. Um, when I came to Berlin, I think he was like the only guy. <laughs> Everybody said, oh, you have to Stanislav. And also he was teaching already at that time. The community has been growing, but you're still teaching and you're still yeah. inspiring <laughs> people. So uh, very curious to hear what you bring us today. Okay, um, I Thank tried to compensate the time I'm working with Touch Designer by chaotic organization of my presentation. <laughs> Somehow, I also have to say that Dara sitting here on my place before was also a guy doing Touch Designer, as well as uh, one Japanese guy who is completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, something like 2015, we tried to make some first Touch Designer meetup in Berlin which was quite uh, funny, it was four guys, literally. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, some short words about me. I started to make computer graphics by late 90s, something like 98. Then one uh, crazy person showed me to Goudini, something around 2001. Actually, the time the Touch Designer was invented. And then uh, I felt completely uh, that is my stuff. So I, uh, somehow he explained me quite simple how it works and I understood. It was a time with no tutorials and no workshops and nothing. So then uh, I was living in Munich for a long time, working in film production. Then someday I realized that actually what I'm fucking doing in Munich is completely not my city. I came to Berlin first time in 2003 and because I was young, I realized that okay, the city is amazing, but what I do here, so I moved to Moscow for some time. And that was occasionally the time that full that um, uh, 3D mapping, uh, etc. boom started. So I started to work with two big companies in Moscow who were doing, uh, one company was uh, run by Vadim Epstein, who is now very quite known AI person, doing a lot of crazy stuff with machine learning. And another company was Sila Sveta. And Sila Sveta was uh, working with Touch Designer. And after I seen Touch Designer on stage, I realized that actually I can do it. So I started to make it immediately. And that was, I think, 2012. So that is a short uh, story. I think I also started to teach 2001. It was uh, uh, the course about Disney animation in Maya. So we made like two weeks with my first wife and she, she is like animation director. And that was crazy course. By the way, then 2000 uh, something, I don't know. Six, seven, I started to do Goudini courses. Then I stopped for some while, and then I started already with Touch Designer uh, as I moved to Berlin. So, and uh, once I was invited to Wroclaw to the film studio where I done first time the workshop mixed Goudini and Touch Designer. Since that time, I found that's actually a super cool topic because it's like to teaching about father and daughter, like something like that. So that now it's became real. But first I want to, uh, instead of shameless self-promotion, I want to make a bit of presentation of what I'm doing artistically, because I think um, my, however I do visuals, my first uh, thing of my life is music. And uh, because of that, and uh, like continuing last presentation I want to show another interactive project we done with one my friend who is a Buto performer living also in Berlin and actually we just started a super huge uh, research in in the field of uh, how we can make visuals uh, or music by the body so actually the story was simple I got connect like everyone here I think and then also I bought one uh, module for modular which was able to send control voltages speaking on touch designer language is kind of chop for analog stuff so basically it's directly like, like that and then I came to my friend and said hey we have a possibility to do anything 
with analog gears by the movement. Then uh, I started also to think, okay, I don't want to make, uh, don't want to make another nerdy performance. It kind of, oh, we have a sensor, let's like do body theremin stuff. So then we spent actually a half of year of intensive work. Uh, trying to find the philosophy and different way of doing technology with that. And um, I think we done actually only three or four performances by that. And yeah, we're still researching. So I think next topic is to bring that system to the spatial sound. But I will try to explain what we managed to make. So basically that was the first teaser we shot. produced by the body movement so it's like explaining that is a module called uh, expert sleepers 8 which is basically a sound card which can be directly controlled by touch designer and then, then I In this patch, it was um, sound controlled by the speed of movement. So we were generating envelopes by intensity of movement. Okay, then uh, after some time, we done something like that. That was the user interface. Basically, it's quite simple. It's just <laughs> <laughs> basically it's just. Uh, uh, um, tool which has a uh, rearranger, remapper. So the idea was like uh, we don't have any possibility to save presets for modular system, at least for e Eurorack system. And I wanted not to patch on the stage. So in, in order to have like precise artistical uh, touch of every uh, part of performance dramatically. So we needed to change everything. So I was just mapped all that 16 outputs I had to uh, all that uh, parts of user interface and then I could save presets. That's all. And it was additional tool which was needed to visualize and also to map venue because we came. So first idea Valentin got was that, okay, let's change the sound by my position on, position on stage. So we, I bought a special module for that, which has XY mixing and controlled XY position by that small tool, which was mapping his position. So on the end, it was five synthesizers controlled by his movement on stage. Okay, and yeah, I show some nice pictures. Then we also decided we don't do any visuals out of body and light and lasers. So we've done two lasers and some stage lights controlled everything by touch designer. So can I show another sh short teaser of that performance? Uh. Oh.
started with the body stuff. I want to show you now the work we done together with the same guy. It was a music video produced for uh, Believe Defect, which is one of my favorite industrial projects from US. I seen occasionally post of a uh, guy from Believe Defect on Facebook and he was asking someone to make a movie and I actually was dreaming to make a movie for him. Then somehow I got like in 30 seconds in concept. So then we just, it was start of COVID time. So I was quite happy not to fly <laughs> somehow because in 2019 I was flying something like 57 times. So, and then I said for two and a half months doing that, it was mixed of uh, Goudini and Touch Designer. So everything based also on Kinect, kind of self-speaking. The result you can see is completely mad. produced completely in touch that's um, nice white lines uh, is actually open CV multiplied by my custom geometry shader for plexus effect quite cool effect very easy done and yeah okay I have to say I really uh, work a long time in research about this audio reactive stuff so that is very important for me 
That's why I was spent a long time thinking about every detail, how to synchronize sound to different things. And because Goudini has completely the same chops uh, like touch, basically all audio reactive effects in Goudini were do done on the same principle, but in 3D. This is the thing. So I want to show maybe two other short pieces of my things and maybe then they'll talk about something else. So one uh, one short project I just showed teaser. It was also done during during COVID time and it was kind of my personal reflection on that apocalyptic start of apocalypse. So my the music was created by me in one night, like one hour piece. And then I spent some time doing visuals. And that project was kind of collaboration with uh, Natalie Golubenko, who is a Berlin-based video artist. And another project I done last year in Ra Russia that was for so Quadra sound system plus three screens, actually four screens, one LED screen and three projections, and kind of my music. And the idea, the idea came partly from uh, my girlfriend of that time. So we were like collaborating too. And she had actually a very cool idea, which I spent a long time how to fucking make it in touch designer. She wanted to generate on sound random lines and on point of intersection of these lines, it should be like point produced. So I spent um, some time before I occasionally got to idea to make um, Python SOP which was analyzing that things and typically if you some of you know like about the script operators in touch it's typically you write clean on the start I just don't done clean <laughs> <laughs> so in the end it was working kind of like solver <laughs> just saving newly generated points until I press button to reset so you can show the patch later so the installation was 15 minutes, so I just rendered it especially today because we still didn't get some movie for that. But I would just scroll, finding some cool places. But it was also, I, I done a multi-channel sound and then sent it from Ableton all channels. So it was quite well designed for all uh, interactions of sound.
Then we have not so much time, so we need to left some time for the questions. So the last thing I want to tell, I just, uh, because I have possibility, <laughs> I want not really to promote, but explain the concept behind my, behind my workshop, because that website is still not really cool. So I'm moving everything now to my own custom website and to learning platform. So basically I'm doing kind of online academy now, that's my plan because I spent already 20 years teaching, so I decided to bring it to the proper level. And first idea, I was doing that uh, small web shop that I wanted to bring all possible questions about Touch Designer in one place. So that's why it's all possible topics actually cover it, like jelly cell, uh, lights, audiovisual stuff, uh, VJing, uh, programming, I think now we have much more topics because, because like we have AI, etc. That is yet not covered, but kind of that was the idea behind. So theoretically, if you are only interested to learn touch designer or some particular stuff, I was trying to make very, very qualitative uh, lessons and also not all workshops I produced still there because we were also doing with some Canadian guy workshop about C++ and Touch Designer, which was quite cool. Then a, a bit some words about that Goudini course. I really like uh, wordplay, uh, that, that's why I actually called it workshop how to touch. <laughs> because how is like a Python name of Goudini module. <laughs> and uh, the idea was, uh, I mean, Goudini and Touch Designer are quite uh, adding to each other, so they have completely the same concept. So I mean, if you like, just compare uh, Goudini to Touch, you have basically the same story, just connecting in vertical way instead of horizontal. And uh, I mean, if you go to SOPS and want to do some cool modeling, you see that menu, I can scroll it until Monday. So, I mean, touch designer is quite limited. And if you, by the way, understand a lot from the GPU side, you can also not just directly export geometry from Goudini to touch, but you have to choose to combine where you want just export points or like using vert vertex animated, animated textures, because everything we have in Goudini already, so we can do a lot of crazy complex uh, things in Houdini and then just render it in Touch Designer or even mix different point clouds, for example, by the some sensor inputs. And also very cool that both now, both Touch Designer and Houdini are very well integrated in Unreal. So it's kind of, I, I made kind of a picture <laughs> about that how I imagine the ideal pipeline and why we need to use that. I mean, it's very simple. We have Houdini, we have touch. We can do that written up in Houdini, written down in touch. Then we have like Substance Designer, which is integrated all free software. So we can use the same pipeline for texturing. Uh, we have Python in both programs. We have a lot of common formats. And what is actually very important that Goudini has a very special data format supported by SOP and CHOP. So basically, in comparison to exporting 3D geometry, let's say from Cinema on 3D Max, you have all that groups, attributes, so it's all metadata. So it's actually much uh, better than just export geometry. And on the end, we have Goudini engine and touch engine, which give us a possibility to render. And like uh, my colleague before said, actually touch is a very amazing tool to make everything connected to everything and control. But I think uh, to make really cool photorealistic rendering in touch, you, you need to have power. It takes years, actually, but 
yeah, it depends on what kind of style style you want to achieve. So and currently I finally decided to make a next round. So if you want, there is a website where I def disc there is uh, a lot of information about the program. So it's like now it's ten and half months, and every uh, it contains three blocks, three levels, crash start, where we go basics, then we go quite advanced about the content management then we go deeply in SOP because for my opinion the lot of touch designer users coming from video art and those doesn't really understand the power of SOPs and this is quite important because even if you don't really want to make a geometry by, but want to make kind of uh, interfaces with render peak you can access that Sops, attributes, etc., or even if you write shaders. So then, second module is mostly about uh, Houdini, about procedural modeling uh, and dynamic simulation, and third level is about system architecture, a lot about Kinect, real sense, etc., data visualization, audio visual setup, and last part will be about. Uh, integration to Unreal. So that's kind of story. I think I almost managed to time. It's okay. So I'm open to any question. How so. much um, programming experience do you need to do that? Uh, so basically I started... Uh, no, if uh, you... If I, 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 that, that course is basically done for completely newcomers. Okay. However, from my experience, even people who has two, three years of experience coming to that course typically are quite uh, discovering stuff because uh, my concept is to make very academic. So I go not uh, teaching buttons, but explaining the idea behind. And the idea behind is just data flow. Basically, it's visual programming anyway. And doesn't matter if you write code or make it by notes. If you don't understand the logic of programming, then you do something wrong <laughs> in that sense. So that is the thing. So I spent a lot of effort to get people into understanding the concept of logic of programming. Um, gre greetings from Canada. Uh, Isabel says she's uh, happy to see you again presenting. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Cheers to her. <laughs> JetX is also saying uh, that he likes the music and asks where the party is at. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I organize some party, I will update them. Okay, officially there is no integration, yeah? How uh, BH Classic, Alembic, FBX, USD. So we have four tools and also animation expert and also vertex animation texture. So there are actually five ways. Theoretically, both Goudini and Touch available as a Python modules. And uh, for Touch it doesn't really work because I mean it's only work inside of uh, Touch Designer. But Goudini can be called as a module completely without interface. That's mean if you produce a digital asset with some kind of user interface, theoretically, you can load it as RPC, like a real-time protocol, and just make it work like a, a geometry server. Another thing I seen on the forum some years ago, one uh, touch designer guy was doing uh, Goudini engine to touch designer, because actually it's open API. So if you if you want you everyone can actually integrate it, the same like it's integrated into Unreal, but I suppose it's actually it's built big work. But at least if you have to expert geometry with let's say Alembic, which is quite nice to manage because it's one file for the animation, then you have all the data there. So it's not only point position; it's all like colors, custom attributes, line widths. And if you create it in Goudini, then you can render it, for example, with line material and touch designer. So it looks like not completely automated pipeline, but still. Okay. So, 
I have both. I mean, uh, now we have Redshift, which is quite cool to making easily nice pictures. Then we have uh, Karma, which is new XPU-based engine, so it's mixed by GPU and uh, CPU in Goudini. And the thing is, it's completely based on USD pipeline. It's, it, it's actually huge. I mean, uh, the concept is super cool because it's originally designed by Pixar for working of big studios. That means it's actually XML file and uh, you kind of have priority. So if you're working on the same project with a tons of people, then some people can have priority to change the final results. So it's, it's a lot of metadata. And theoretically in Dutch we have that also. I mean, we have here in comps we have FBX and USD and using USD I think actually looking to the future is most optimal way to transfer data Uh, sorry? You mentioned that you use OpenCV in your work flows. I'm specifically interested in the part where you were sort of absorbing, you were videotaping your friend who's the dancer. Uh, yeah, yeah. And using the process message, is that something you use through OpenCV? So basically, that particular patch is just uh, the example from hell. I mean, there is an example how to uh, do it in script operators. So basically, I just done it directly with. A script SOP instead of script CHOP like in written in help so I get the feature points and then I have my custom geometry shader that generate lines around because it's super fast so geometry shaders is also my favorite topic because theoretically using geometry shader you, you can generate geometry runtime and depends on graphic card and amount of attributes you're sending over the geometry sh shader engine you can generate let's say until let's say 70 points per original point and connected by lines or polygons so it's quite cool and also what, what is very cool Goudini has VEX language which is kind of originally it was a shading language so if you understand that in VEX, then you will understand also GLSL. Theoretically, Python is also similar in both Goudini and Touch Designer. They both have uh, scripted operators and the library looks similar. So basically, if you get one language, you can understand everything else. Just the difference is amount of ready uh, libraries. And VEX VEX is crazy because it's even faster than operators. A question. Uh, is a cloud changing for uh, uh, Unreal working at runtime? Uh, so, uh, a touch engine for Unreal, is, is it working at runtime? Yes. Okay, so it's not like Houdini engine that is not working. Um, yeah, Goudini engine theoretically, theoretically could also work, but it's just slow. I mean, it's no, just uh, it's cooking geometry. But uh, touch engine is completely the same what you have in engine uh, engine comp. So you do a tox and then interface it to Unreal by the blueprints. That is quite cool because I mean, uh, blueprints programming. I I'm I'm not a prof in that, and I, I just seen from uh, Unreal forums that like uh, complicated stuff are done anyway in C plus plus or C sharp. Uh, then uh, blueprints is also complex. So theoretically, you can do all logic part in touch and just output the data, final results. And also you don't need to program like sensors, whatever, Kinects, not load plugins. You have only one host which can send all the data over to Unreal and back. That makes sense. Good. Good. OK. 
Okay, break.
Okay, everybody, um, we're back with uh, much more sharpness, <laughs> and we're very happy to have Marcus again, who, um, yeah, is a very good friend and joins us every time, and um, he's gonna tell us about the news news from Touch Designer, and also if you have any question for the derivative headquarter, just throw, throw, throw them at him, please. Um, Markus. Uh, hello, hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining, or thanks for having me again. Um, yeah, well, what's new? We just released a new official, I think, yesterday or two days ago. And um, I have been talking about that the last couple of meetups already, so maybe I'll just make it short. If you check out the release notes, uh, let me share the screen, actually. Oops, share there. Um, if you check out the uh, release notes, you can basically uh, grasp what all we have changed here, just for uh, those of you who haven't listened in on the last meetups. So we have a full Apple Silicon support now. So there's an extra um, installer for the M1 uh, Max there. Uh, the whole touch designer is now built up on the Vulkan API. Uh, there's no more OpenGL in there. And um, we do support compute shaders now on all platforms, in, including macOS. With that, also, we just uh, updated the uh, particle system that you can find in the palette. So there's now a particle system that actually works very well on Mac as well, with a couple extra features. Uh, yeah, it's fun to play with and good to explore. Um, and the other big things is ESP support as well as uh, comment boxes. So that's a nice thing. If you finally want to uh, comment your network, then this is easily possible by hitting Alt and dragging with your mouse and you get a nice comment box. But um, having said that, I thought maybe, um, well, go out and download and uh, see if you like it and let us know if everything's working or what you're missing. Um, having said that, I wanted to kind of uh, maybe take a look on things that I've been working on in the last little while. So one big thing that just finished was the particle GPU component in the palette. Uh, you can find that under tools, which down here somewhere, where is it? Uh, well, you find it. I don't know what it's called, particle GPU. Anyway, here, there, great. Um, and then um, just recently, Shandor, wrote an email that he's still having trouble blending things. And I know this has been always a problem with um, CampSnapper especially, but also any of the other blending software that we have. You might see that in here, that it creates these weird bright edges. And this has been, um, this has been bugging me for a long time, but I never came up with a good solution to it, or I couldn't find a good solution because I thought, well, I'm doing everything after the book, so what else is there to do? Um, having like after the book means I'm using for edge blending. We just uh, went to Paul Borg because he is kind of the authority on edge blending or blending generally. There's a great article on how to properly edge blend projectors. And uh, this network that comes out of all of this stuff can be found in, for example, CampSnapper, this little one here. Um, it's in CampSnapper, it's in, um, where else? Any of the uh, projector blend components all use the same uh, formula, but you always end up with these edges, these bright edges here. And this has been really bugging me and people as well, because you can never get a nice blend. So sometimes it's just about entering the right, um, the right search terms. And it took me a couple of years to enter those right search terms to find a different formula to do this. Um, and maybe as a little, as a little technical side, how this is done, this edge blending, it's actually not too hard. Every projector that's pointing onto uh, um, an object in CampSnapper, for example, also has a light in it. And the light is being used as a, uh, like a simulating projector. So then in a render top, I have a shader uh, hooked up to, um, to the render top basically. 
And this shader now has all these different cameras and all these different lights, and it can loop through these different lights. Like from my current camera, I can basically look what lights are hitting my area. And um, these lights, I can look at their UVs that they're projecting out. And then I can tell, oh, OK, if I have a, um, from a different light, a UV that falls into my area, I can calculate the distance of the UV that I found to the edge because I know where I am in my current projection. And um, I count all of these up and then divide it by the number of overlaps. And I get something that looks like this and has these awful edges everywhere. Um, yeah, so finally, um, looking around, wait, do I have the paper here? I don't have it here. Finally, I found a paper that is actually talking about this and uh, maybe somewhere here. I know that's going to take me too long to find. Anyway, um, and they apply a little bit, bit a different function to the whole thing. And with that different function, which is the same idea, you just to look at these lights, uh, calculate the edge distance, and um, then apply a cyanodal function to it. And you get this really nice, smooth blend curves here which uh, hopefully solve a lot of these issues um, with Camp Schnapper or when you're doing projection blending in domes or on whatever else surfaces. So uh, this came up because, yeah, again, uh, Shandor brought it up and then uh, many people before brought that issue up. I could never solve it. Uh, then just recently, Simon and Marco, who are in Berlin, not sure if they're actually at the meetup right now. Don't see them. No. Um, they struggled with this as well. So uh, I finally figured this out and we'll put it into the uh, yeah upcoming, the next release, basically, whatever comes out next, um, will have that fix or this enhancement in it for much nicer blend curves um, between projectors. That should really help with a lot of things. And the other thing I've been working on is, um, let me just unshare my screen to introduce you to the whole concept. No, wait, where do I unshare? Stop share. There. So the other thing that I that walked into the office is this ridiculous uh, camera setup here, which is basically a entry level um, movie camera, digital camera with a lens. And then we um, purchased these uh, it's there. These uh, follow focus things. So they're about 90 bucks. This one follow focus element. And then um, we also purchased these cranks here that connect to the follow focus and then a little hot shoe connector, which we glued onto the crank. And the hot shoe connector then made it possible to uh, plug or to screw in these wife trackers. So the camera setup now has uh, three bike trackers, one to track the camera position, one to track the zoom, and the other side, one to track the focus. And the idea of all of this is that I want to be able to do, um, this has been, it's been a long project. I've been working on this for a while, but, uh, what I'm trying to do is this, essentially. What you see here is a camera and a render. So the camera films an LED stage. And uh, I'm overlapping this, what the camera is filming or superimposing a render onto it. And you can see it maybe a little bit. Uh, let's see if I can find a good frame for this. Uh, you see a little bit like the edges here are slightly offset. So that shows the inaccuracies in the whole in the whole calibration process. The idea behind this was that we'll put Aruco markers onto all of the LED tiles. The nice thing is we know that LED tiles are flat, so we can nicely detect those Aruco markers. And then from that, we can calibrate the lens itself of the camera, and we can also calibrate the or find out the position of the camera relative to the LED stage. And by that, eventually build a little XR setup. 
Um, now, uh, as you see, this has been a while, April 16th, 2021, because when I then went further with it, I always got into this, I always had this issue that there was an offset. I could never get this precise. And uh, I kind of tabled the whole thing because if we would remote into um, a friend's LED stage and try to work on this remote and then um, locally here, I've been working with my well, like a point and shoot camera connecting wife trackers to it, but that's not really precise either. So now I have a proper setup and can go again, restart this whole uh, process of calibration. And uh, what I started with initially was this um, lens calibrator component, which is built out of other calibration components that are kind of a tool set. And the inspiration for that perhaps came from Elliot Woods of uh, Kimchi and Chips, he had this tool set called Ruler. Um, he borrowed the inspiration for his user interface from Patch Designer. So all the calibration functions were in little um, operators and you could, every calibration is different. So you always need to assemble them differently. And I took that again as an inspiration then to build um, operators that do these different calibration steps. So for example, I have a operator here that creates different boards. So I can pick if it should be a Shiruko or whatever kind of calibration board. And I have a component that does the fine pattern. Um, so this just takes the, looks for, looks for the checker board that's defined here and tries to find it in the image. And it tries to calculate the pose of it. That's a different component. Um, there's a calibrated camera component and so on. So there's a lot of components that all together then make a calibration sequence. So when building um, a tool that can calibrate a camera or cali calibrate a camera lens, I can make use of these pre-built components and put them into a new, um, yeah, put them together into a UI that then allows me to go through such a calibration process. And all about all of this is about uh, putting the camera into a space so that I uh, can simulate the camera inside Touch Designer, render virtual content that perfectly matches the uh, camera's view, or the, I can render stuff into the camera view perfectly if I have all of these components together. Now, again, what I had was the with the stage here, it presented a couple of problems. One was that when, when I was zoomed out quite a bit, I could easily calibrate to the stage, but you need to calibrate different zoom levels because the lens, how it, lenses are built, you have different um, uh, deformations, let's call it deformations in the lens uh, when you're zooming. So you need to also calibrate for really close zoom and then you get into these issues that LEDs have it's single LEDs and then it zooms so far that you only see single LEDs and not the patterns anymore. So that didn't, that didn't get me any further. Um, so I found that I have to calibrate first against a uh, Shahuko board, which is basically like one of those things here. And um, initially we started with, my desk is a mess. Uh, initially, we started with these kind of self-made boards, but I kind of needed to figure out, okay, it's all these errors that I'm getting, like it's all multiple or additive, all these errors. So um, that's printed. It's not flat. So there's errors there. Then I was using a point and shoot. So I've got weird stuff happening with the lens there or not a precise description of the lens. So one step after the other, we basically went with a nice flat um, produced Sharuko board, found that important, and, um, and a proper camera. And the process to calibrate now is uh, fairly simple. Basically, I'm just going to take you quickly through the process here as it's, uh, as it's working now. 
So I can um, enter all my camera settings, the sensor size, resolution, the focal length of the lens that I'm using, um, the calibration for it, as I had shown you. We have trackers. My trackers are not connecting right now, so I unfortunately cannot show that. And then the lens calibration itself. And this is an automatic process. So you select the uh, zoom setting that you want to start calibrating with and then hit start calibration. Just going to do one zoom line here. And uh, then I have this automatic thing that basically fetches those boards. And I said I wanted to do 10. So there's a little there's a little network that basically does uh, motion detection in a very simple way. Eight, maybe here. Nine, ten. All right, got all of those. And now I can review everything. I can kind of check if those things work out. First of all, I have a view of. I, or I can see what the calibration error is for every, or reprojection error is for all of these snapshots that I took. Um, I can have a board-centric view kind of to see, this is um, as if the board was static and the camera was moved, but you also can look at it the other way around. So the static camera and the different boards here, this is mostly kind of a sanity check that you can see, okay, what have I done here? Is this um, kind of what I did? Um, there's other things you can check actually what the, how precise it is by comparing the found and the uh, projected position. So the, the green arrow or the green um, cross is the uh, found point of the corners and the red one is what the after calibrating it, what the theoretical point would be on the board. So you see it's pretty precise. It's pretty much all overlaying nicely. Um, and I can also see these board overlays. Oh, I can zoom here, damn it. Okay, anyway, but uh, you, this is projecting or rendering um, this, the board that I have on top of the image that I captured. And you can see also that this is all pretty precise here. When you see errors, like you see that, for example, this one has a fairly high uh, reprojection error, I can turn that off and recalibrate everything. Um, sometimes it improves uh, the, uh, sometimes it improves it quite a bit, but this time didn't do much, so that doesn't matter. Um, here I still have to do something. You can refine all of these uh, of the lens settings. And um, for lens interpolation, so that you can interpolate between those different lens deformations over different zoom levels and focus levels. And I have a view on the raw data. So this component itself basically allows me to calibrate a lens, which is an important step. And the next step is to put this into a scene. Um, oh, I should mention, right, these trackers basically allow me to uh, um, the trackers that I have, and unfortunately I can't show you because they won't connect. Um, they let me get the zoom and the focus from the Vive. And uh, they are, um, they are kind of all in the same space, but uh, I want to only get the rotation of one of those trackers instead of the transformation. So I somehow have to put them into relationship to the camera tracker that's up here, so that I just get this uh, that rotation. Of it. And um, this can be, all, it's also fairly simple to do this in touch designer, luckily, because we have this transform chop which um, lets you do a matrix multiplication and um, invert matrices. So the idea is that my um, the camera tracker here, I get, that was the easiest way for me to actually get the uh, transform matrix. I usually use this null um, and null comp, uh, which I transform and then via the object chop, get the uh, transform matrix 
then plug this into a transform, invert the camera's transform, and multiply it with the tracker's transform, which puts the tracker's transform into the same, um, let's say, space as the camera transform. And I get only this, uh, it's the Y rotation actually from it, from which I can tell what setting, like what zoom or focus setting it has. So it's not, not too difficult actually to put that together. And this will then be driving um, in the camera tracker the zoom and focus settings. So as I said, the next step is to get this all into, um, into one space and align it to the screen so that I can do what I did here, that I can render virtual content into the real world or on top of the real world. Now, I always get this offset and it's really annoying. So what I'm basically trying to figure out is the position of the camera tracker relative to the camera, um, to the camera sensor. And uh, that has proven difficult. Now, then Michelle posted in our internal chat that the wife, they, they now have a whole uh, camera tracking system. It's called Wife Mars CamTrack. And uh, I was going through their documentation and um, they do, they're really sneaky how they do this. I mean, it's, I don't know, but sometimes it's just hard to think about things. So I'm trying to calibrate against an LED screen with a Sharuko board on it to get the position of that relative to the camera, relative to the tracker, and then figure out via another OpenCV function what the position of the tracker is to the lens. What they are doing is much more clever. They basically have their calibration board and they put a hole in it and they attach a tracker to the calibration board. So now that gives you a relationship between the Haruko board to, or the, the tracker board to the, uh, uh, to the sensor. But you also have the relationship of the uh, tracker that's attached to the board to the tracker that's attached to the camera. And now you have a closed system where you can easily figure out the uh, position of the camera tracker relative to the camera sensor. So this is now my next step. I'm gonna uh, try again to actually calibrate with, the, uh, with a screen just to see if I still get these offsets or if these offsets were actually based on all the inaccuracies that I had from using my point and shoot and using a different vibe setup and et cetera and uh, whatever. Or if I still get this offset and then I'll go to the approach of having actually uh, drilling a hole into this and attaching another tracker to this thing, to the Saruko board so that I can figure out the proper position that I just explained the uh, camera tracker to the camera sensor. Um, with that, so why am I doing this? Well, theoretically, this is kind of, um, it's not inexpensive necessarily, but it's a fairly inexpensive way compared to industry solutions that are out there to do um, XR at home. So if you have a green wall or something like this, we have a green wall here. Um, then you could just uh, use the green wall, um, calibrate the camera into your scene, and then um, you have a very nice tracking solution. Similar, this should be working with monitors. If you're using a monitor to show content on, that then the content on the monitor is rendered in, uh, in the right uh, perspective of your, uh, yeah real camera and really theoretically this should also work with projection but um, that's something uh, further down the line and this would allow people with a fairly low cost investment like maybe um, maybe you have a slr camera at home and you have a lens uh, you just need to buy the trackers the lighthouses from wife and the zoom and uh, focus follow devices to basically track the camera and um, have a little XR studio at home or in your studio. 
so yeah, that's what I've been doing. Um, and I hope it's useful maybe to some. So uh, any questions? <laughs> Let me move into the picture. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear. Um, that's uh, that's waiting there for us to have a Christmas party. So. COVID uh, interrupted the last one, hence that's still up. All right, no questions. So th this is a, like a really technical question, but for Vulcan, um, what exactly, like is anything going to change like in terms of like OpenGL shaders? or things like that, I, like, is, is, is that a feature that is going to be changing in the future? Um, there, is, there, is no, there is no technical change to your shaders or anything like that. This stays all the same. Uh, Vulcan is, allows us to go further in the future. It's basically we needed to, to do this to be ready for what might come. Uh, but there's no technical change to, except that, that now compute shaders are also supported on Mac OS. There's no other technical change there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I really have nothing else. Have fun, say something. Oh, um, hi, Marcus. <laughs> um, I can't remember what the question was. But I do have, I just had a spot. Um, you did a show recently with Kamaru. Can you show yeah. us yeah. what you did? I'm, I'm sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did, uh, so this goes back to last summer. I had the chance to do some visuals for Camaro in um, for a show. And uh, then he asked me a short while ago to do, uh, if I could do a video for him. Um, uh, sorry, now I'm looking. And uh, I'm not sure if I have that file here. So it's, it was a fairly long video that was published. Oh, I guess I should share my screen. So this video was published on the, uh, by, on Shape and Crack magazine. And I, I was basing this on the, uh, on using the spectrum top mainly and, uh, the idea, so it's basically, yeah, it's, it creates, I'm not sure how well that comes through and compression is probably terrible, but um, you can create the, what I think really interesting uh, movement and patterns by putting very simple shapes and animations through the spectrum top and uh, mixing mixing the frequency and the phase that you get out of the spectrum top between different images. So uh, it's, it's a fairly heavy process, unfortunately, but um, it's a rewarding one. The idea is, let's just take a noise, for example, um, and make that a little bit bigger, 90, 20, 10, 80, and taking a spectrum top there we go. So we have a spectrum. Well, let's let's do something. Let's, let's get the text. This text is cut too. 
website text, and here I'll just say A and here I'll take B. I'm also a spectrum. And so the spectrum is the spectrum top is pretty much the same thing as a spectrum chop. It gives you uh, frequency and phase over um, over two dimensions, while for the spectrum chop, it's more one dimensional over time. Here you have a two dimensional representation of your image described in frequency and uh, phase. So I can create the spectrum, interesting by itself, and you can kind of tell what it gives you. Like you get those diagonal lines and things like that. You can kind of tell what the major features of a of an image are that are coming into here. Uh, for example, if I rotate that this, this here, uh, translate, transform, rotate. You can see that the whole thing rotates with it. So um, anyway. Out of the spectrum, I can recreate the original image in black and white. You can always just do one uh, one channel per um, per spectrum. So the spectrum converts into a spectrum, and then we have the mode inverse. So I can create the inverse of that again, come from A and go back to A. Now I have two channels in the spectrum, as I said, frequency and phase. So I can mix now these uh, these channels. So, for example, just put a cross here, and let's just cross. Um, let's just cross on the frequency domain, and then let's reorder and get the other. Put two. Let's get the phase domain again into here and put this back into here. So now I have a mix out of um, A and B in the frequency do domain only. If I would mix everything, I can, it's just a regular crossfade. Actually, oh, wait, sorry. Oop. Ah. So it's just a regular crossfade between A and or almost regular crossfade between A and B. But I can I can start messing around with these uh, separate separately, mixing them separately or deforming them separately, um, and uh, that allows me to uh, create these kind of patterns, essentially. So I don't know. Uh, can't really think right now too much of uh, what I did there, but it's like just scaling, for example, the frequency domain creates all of these uh, strange hilly areas or something. Uh, it's a very giving little network and whatever you plug in between the discrete Fourier transform and the inverse. You can play with that quite a bit. Uh, another video that's based on this whole concept is, uh, let me find that. It's me. This one here, Saele Valesa. Uh, this is also, this is actually just, uh, I'm using a spectrum here as an initial thing, but I'm using the spectrum top converted, uh, spectrum chop converted to a spec to a top, and then feed that through the spectrum top, do stuff with it and go back. And um, somehow while playing around with this, I was able to get to these uh, fiery or yeah, flame-like, looks that yeah I played around with more add a little bit of lens distort um, and that's pretty much it yeah um, so yeah 
this is the uh, spectrum top that I'm using quite frequently nowadays in various videos and just playing around. Like it's mostly with those shows that I do, it's a lot of uh, think of Patch Designer as an instrument and you can build yourself or as an instrument, um, as an instrument construction kit and you build yourself an instrument and then you learn how to play that instrument. And you just have this freedom to construct that instrument in the wildest ways. Uh, it's, yeah. But what, what melodies you get out of it is totally up to you. Every time a new instrument. The same applies to the, the show that I'm doing with Franz Chopin. It's a mm -hmm. uh, similar concept. The show I did with her and Richard Cartier were also um, all experimentation. It's actually, it's literally, it's all experimentation, playing around, seeing what works. Um, how can I, how can I control this? Because I don't use any scenes or anything. It's all uh, live controlled. There's no audio input to things. Well, um, in the last video I showed you that definitely had audio input, but usually there's no audio input to things. So it's just um, performative. Um. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a question on this. <laughs> and uh, it showed up uh, recently, somebody asked me, and it's also been discussed on the Facebook group, where people want to use uh, LTC, the LTC time code in to synchronize their shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I always find it a bit weird that if, if you use the timer, which I'm a huge fan of, like everything needs to go controlled by a timer, but the timer only reads seconds. So now my thinking is that um, you always have to go through the painful process of taking this time code, calculating into seconds, to then be able to drive a timer, which uh, has no problem to output whatever it does as a time code through the info uh, dot. But it's really weird that you cannot input time code. Um, is, is, is there like a shortcut or is this more of a feature request that maybe would be cool to just be able to plug mm. time code in a thing that outputs time code? Or what would your take on that be? I think, I think that's a good feature request. Yeah, I can't think currently. So you want to drive the timer directly with what comes in from the LTC in, if I understand that correctly? Yeah, maybe that's now not, not the, the proper use case, but um, maybe it's a two-part question. The one thing is the, the time code comes in like in hour, minutes, seconds, and frames, but the timer in itself doesn't understand that format. So that format, uh, format. yeah. Um, um, tell him natively to jump to, to a certain time code, even if that mm -hmm. time code is part of the time that you control with your timer. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think uh, I would have to, I honestly haven't done too much with LTC. So I would have to investigate that a little bit more what the what the straight pathway for that would be. Yeah, I can't give you the answer for that right now. But um, outputting for for the LTC to output, I also don't have an LTC sample file right now. I thought there was one. Also, the timer outputs the time code in dot, but it doesn't output it in the same format as the LTC because the LTC, the LTC gives the chop LTC. channels. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we had some. I'll, I'll have to get back to you on this. I have. I don't have the right answer for that right now. Mm -hmm. out. Right, yeah, no. You have to convert it always to, yeah, second minute frame, second minute hour, or other way around. You need something that converts it for you, basically. Feature request. It would be just cool if the timer would be compatible with time code in a way. Maybe some Python function which can do it automatically. If 
a bunch, of, a bunch of mass jobs basically currently, but yeah, now I can see that being useful. The uh, feature request. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just one question. In the spectrum top, do you use a render select in order to get the two textures separately? Or how, how can you output the two, the phase and the frequency separately? Um, so the, um, the spectrum is basically an, R, uh, an RG, it has the format RG. So if you want to, um, you either do separate separate operations on it by just uh, using the channel mask on the uh, on the operators so you can say okay i just want to cross the r channel the green channel would be for or transform only transform one of the channels uh, the other way you can deal with this is by uh, or how i'm doing this is usually the reorder because here i can um, say okay i just want to have input one gets the frequency and uh, my green channel is going to be zero, zero, yeah. And then you just have the one, the one channel, and then you assemble them again afterwards with a real. So um, if I do, if I do an operation here on just the frequency, like uh, uh, and the sort or something like this, and copy paste this. Um, on the other one, I'm going to choose the green channel here. So now I have in my red channel, I now have the face. And now I'm going to do, um, let's say, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll do a level or something on this. Um, then after this, I can use a reorder again and say input one is red. The other one takes the red channel from the second input. And now I again have, the, have them together to be converted into the image itself. So here I'm now controlling the, uh, here I'm now controlling the face. Look at that. If I invert the face, it reflects the image. Um, and here I'm controlling the frequency with, uh, yeah, yep. Well, thank you very much again, and it's very nice to see everybody. Looking forward, forward to seeing everybody, seeing everybody again. again. And, really and really interesting, interesting talks. talks. I, I listened in to both, and it was super nice to uh, learn more about your work. So thanks to you all. Yeah, so this was uh, Touch Designer Roundtable number 13. Thank you all for coming. And um, on the danger that I repeat myself, uh, I'm really looking forward to hear from you for a presentation for the next time, which will be, if I'm not mistaken, June 23rd, or at least a Thursday, which is very close to June 23rd. Um, yeah, and uh, I can only encourage you also to come with work in progress, uh, to look for a discussion. This doesn't have to be like a perfect presentation or anything. Um, yeah, looking very much forward to hear from you. And uh, for those who want to hang out more with some beers, we can meet at the Omega Bar, which is just on the other street side, a bit further down. They're already awaiting us. They have the beer cool <laughs> and the <laughs> water. And that's it. Thank you very much. And hopefully see you the next time.
And of course, the applause was for Wieland, who was uh, behind the scenes, pulling the strings and making this. Mm -hmm.